and welcome. Welcome to this episode of the Maternity and Midwifery Hour. My name's Sue McDonald and I'm the Please curator of the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals and these hours. And these were these actual hours were designed to just provide some information and some continuing professional development instead of the um, face-to-face festivals that we were running. These are supported by Matflix, which is video streaming from mid- midwifery experts. Uh, and that's where you can get your CPD for your revalidation. Very good for student midwives also. Um, And this evening, I am really so pleased to be joined by two fabulous speakers, both of whom have stepped into the breach somewhat, um, one more than the other. (laughs) But I think we've we've ended up with a fantastic um, two speakers, couldn't be bettered. So we have Maria Booker, Programme Director at Birthrights, and Professor Leslie Page, CBE. So both have stepped into the breach and both are fabulous. Can we start with a moment of the week? I'm going to spring this a little on you. And I'll start with, well, who shall I start with? Leslie? Oh, moment of the week. Well, there have been quite a few moments of this week. Um, one of the things that I'm really enjoying um, in this really anxious time, which is so tragic for many people, but one of the things that I'm really enjoying is the the clear skies. I live in Oxford and usually when it gets warm, it's very gray and it's like there's a low ceiling. And one night I looked out and I realized I could see the stars really clearly. And I went out and could see these stars twinkling. Um, You know, that is some solace in a situation which is truly tragic. We've lost so many lives. People have had illnesses that have given them long-term problems, people have been separated from each other, Um, but somehow I think that there might be some lessons to learn. And also meeting with neighbours, I've talked to my neighbours more through the clap for carers, Um, but I just want to say one thing actually, that perhaps the moment of the week was seeing Rachel Miller, midwife, on breakfast this morning. Wow. (laughs) Rachel Miller is on the cover of Vogue, And she spoke so beautifully. And the commentators were asking her about how anxious women are. And she said, yes, they are anxious, but the meaning of midwife is to be with woman. And it's up to her to be with the woman and actually help contain their anxiety. And the commentators all talked about how calm she was and how calming she was. And I thought if ever we needed a picture postcard of midwifery Rachel Miller is it she was both beautiful and dynamic and terribly compassionate and very eloquent so I think that's probably the key moment of my week wonderful I think you cheated by having more than one moment but that's great (laughs) probably had about 10 moments there (laughs) thank you Leslie how about Maria Oh, I don't know about you, but I'm finding it sort of difficult to remember where one week starts <laughs> or one day starts and uh, the next one um, ends. But um, if, if, it's, if it was this week, I think it was this week um, because I, I had some leave to, uh, with my children for half term last week. So I, I sort of came back um, to work properly this week. And um, I, I was saying to Leslie before we started that our advice service is really busy at the moment. And um we're sort of taking it in turns amongst the staff at Birthrights to uh, reply to the inquiries we're receiving. So um, I opened my inbox um, on my first day back from leave and, and had a lovely email from um, a woman that, that we'd um, written to a trust on behalf of who, who was just saying how much she valued our help and uh, how the letter that we'd written had really helped her to, um, you know, to un- unblock the challenge that she was facing with the trust. So that's always really nice to to have that sort of feedback and have that kind of positive affirmation of of what we're doing so that was really really nice (laughs) oh fabulous thank you so much that was two lovely moments or three with the stars being lovely stars which (laughs) has to be something positive and as leslie said it's a very difficult time and we wanted really as a, a forum and as a group to really state the solidarity for and thanks to the people who are caring for people with COVID who are affected 
by COVID, who've lost people with COVID and, and are coping with, with the whole situation. It's a very difficult time and we can't kind of understate that. And I'm kind of aware, and, and Leslie was talking about the Thursday clapping and now we've finished the Thursday clapping. But I think it's still important that we kind of record our thanks to all the NHS workers and the key workers who are keeping everything going, the health service and everything else that makes our world carry on at this difficult time. And, and I've got, I'm, I'm sort of focusing on the news. My, my next bit is always the news. And I was starting with the um, July 2020 UK Vogue having a midwife on the front cover which is fantastic also I understand and I haven't got a copy yet but I think this might be one time that I do buy the Vogue <laughs> there might be other things too and um, which has a, a feature on the day in the life of three key workers and I think that'll be something really positive to, to kind of highlight midwifery in a, in a really positive way and which has also obviously been featured on TV so thank you to Leslie for that. I think one of the issues this week ha has been very much that of race and BME, very high in the news. Firstly, from home with the effects of COVID, um, highlighting that BME people are significantly more at risk of, of being affected and, and uh, of course, to die from COVID-19. And this report has been criticised because it's covering a lot of statistics um, but it's actually not perhaps been um, talking about the actions and recommendations. And I was thinking today that maybe we as a profession really need to read it very carefully, very critically, and then think about how we can individually sort out and, uh, and look at our BME colleagues and make sure they're protected and not exposed to excessive risk. I know it's, it's difficult because if they're working in the health service, looking after on the front line looking after patients they will be at risk but you know making sure they've got the sufficient um, equipment to protect them and making sure they're looked after as we should be looking after each other anyway and of course that's been put in very sharp focus from the news from america which has been horrible um, but i think we do need again we need to look at ourselves we can't just say oh it's america it's not happening here because I think that's what's highlighted that it is happening and we need to really fight racism very actively um, individually and institutionally um, and I have on the resources that you can get after today put um, a, a, a kind of clip a, a link to a clip from a lady called Jane Elliott who who's famous for doing a, um, a, an experiment with children with brown and blue eyes and you'll you'll kind of if you watch the clip, you might find it very illuminating and might challenge your way of thinking wherever you're you are. And um, and then I'm doing a bit of a Skinner sandwich, so I'm going to finish with some good news and, and say a big congratulations to Professor Helen Chain and Elizabeth Banner Bannon and Professor Jean White on all being awarded the prestigious RCM Honorary Fellowship. Very much deserved and really good news. So that's my little Skinner sandwich there. So tonight we're going to be looking at the effect of COVID on maternity services, but we're really in the context of human rights in maternity care for women and their families. And this is really a very critical at the time when we need to be looking at the care we give women to make sure that they are cared for and respected and empowered in their, in their care. So without further ado, I'm really so thrilled to welcome Maria Booker, who is a programme director of the charity Birthrights. Very good resource. Again, there's lots of resources from that um, charity on the resource list. This is a UK charity dedicated to improving maternity care through a focus on human rights. Maria leads the charity's policy and legal work. And as she said, she's very busy balancing and doing juggling. Uh, and also she's birthrights trainer of healthcare professionals and peer supporters. She's previously been UK general manager of Maternity Neighbourhood, which is a US-based midwife-led company, developing a woman-centred electronic maternity record. And she's also 
led the development of the website Which Birth Choice to its launch in 2014, which must have been a major operation indeed. And prior to that, she had a diverse 11 year career in the Department of Business. So she's been a busy lady, but I'm gonna hand the plate to her now. So thank you very much, Maria. Thank you very much, sweetie. Um, can you all see what I'm sharing? <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for that um, introduction, Sue. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about birthrights um, and how we carry out our work. So we run, um, we do our work through a number of uh, streams of work. So we have an advice service uh, for women and for healthcare professionals, which has been very busy in the last few weeks. Um, and we also have a number of resources on our website, as you said. So um, we have a position statement on coronavirus and a Q&A. So do go and have a look at those if you haven't already. Um, in normal times, we do a lot of training um, and training of healthcare professionals face to face. Um, it's not just me, but, but a wider team of associate trainers. Um, and uh, yeah, we really enjoy kind of going out and, and working closely with healthcare professionals. And we also do some research. So we recently did a piece of research with the charity Birth Companions, looking at the experience of women facing severe and multiple disadvantage. And we take the intelligence from our advice service and from our training and from our research, and that informs our policy and campaigning work. So uh, coronavirus, um, I just want to take a moment really to, to recognise what Sue was saying at the beginning, that this has been an incredibly uh, difficult time. And I just want to pay my own respects really as somebody who isn't kind of working in a trust or directly caring for women for all of those of you who are listening, who have been doing that over the last few weeks, um, recognise that it's just been a really challenging time and that people have been doing the very best that they can with um, with the evidence that they have and the resources that they have um, and just to recognise how challenging that's been. Um, so tonight I just wanted to have a little look about how decisions have been made uh, during this time and really to um, empower you or to give you confidence that you would recognise a, a right to respecting decision making decision, even in the time of coronavirus. Um, I think we've seen a lot of really positive things come out of uh, the pandemic. We've seen some trusts really go the distance in terms of committing to keeping all options open to women, including community based services such as home birth or standalone birth centres. We've seen some trusts who've really committed to continuity of care um, and to taking care of, of those who are more vulnerable and, and keeping contact with them. Um, so we've seen a lot of positives. Um, we've also seen a huge increase in the pace of change. I think there are some things that have happened in this crisis that would have taken years to happen um, before. Um, and that's had some real positive benefits, but I think there's also been some decision-making that's uh, perhaps um, a little less robust and that hasn't been as scrutinized as it might've been normally. So um, I thought I'd start by sharing some of the issues that we've been dealing with at Birthrights. So the first really big issue that came across our desk was birth partners. And that was right at the outset of the pandemic, where we saw a number of trusts kind of decide very quickly that um, women couldn't have their birth partner present in labour. And um, thankfully, the Royal Colleges and NHS England made clear very quickly that uh, all women should have an asymptomatic birth partner with them during labour. So that initial crisis uh, got resolved, but we've still seen um, a number of issues around um, women being induced, for example, or women um, being told that they can't have their birth partner with them until it's confirmed that they're in established labour and therefore feeling more under pressure to have a vaginal examination. Um, and there have been wider issues about visitor restrictions. So, for example, uh, some women have not been allowed to have their partner video conferencing into a scan, even if they've experienced a previous loss. Um, and there have been issues around parents visiting babies in neonatal units as, as well. So there's been a whole host of issues around birth partners and visitor restrictions. 
And then the second set of issues that we've been dealing with has been around um, temporary changes to maternity services, and in particular, the withdrawal of home birth services and birth centres, which is I'm sure many of you will know for, for some women feel the only safe option open to them. So we've had a lot of inquiries about that. And also some inquiries um, about elective caesareans also being withdrawn. So there's just that set of issues about um, service reorganisation. And then we've also had quite a few inquiries about pain relief and in particular water. So I think there's been quite a divergent approach to uh, whether water is still available as a form of pain relief and for water birth. Um, and we've had a lot of inquiries about that. We were also concerned um, a few weeks ago about the availability of epidurals, but, but thankfully um, that doesn't seem to have been a, a huge issue. I think that's only happened in a, a very small number of cases. And I think the final um, set of issues I wanted to mention uh, was these issues about more marginalised groups. So uh, Sue's already mentioned the impact on uh, BAME communities. We know that 55% of women, um, pregnant women with COVID have been from a BAME community, which is a, a very big percentage comparable to, to their proportion of the population. Um, but there's also been other marginalised groups as well. So we've been hearing from women with maybe physical disabilities or um, mental health issues who aren't always given the kind of individual consideration that they need. Um, and also from women who might not be able to afford data on a phone, for example, or might have other reasons to find it more difficult to stay in touch with maternity services. So we've had a real wide range of issues over the last 10 weeks. Um, so, what rights do pregnant women and birthing people have in a, in a healthcare crisis? It's important to say that there are some rights which are absolutely non-negotiable, um, and that includes that women and birthing people always have the right to a safe um, birth. And by safe, I mean both psychological, psychologically safe as well as physically safe. Um, they always have the right to be treated with dignity and respect. And they always have the right to basic care. Um, so where postnatal restrictions on visitors have been put in place, and this goes actually across the hospital, not just in maternity, but the trust need to be uh, confident that they have the staff to ensure that um, women or patients elsewhere have the, have the access to food and to drink and can get the toilet and have the right to those basics of care. Otherwise, there's a risk of um, inhuman or degrading treatment. So those are the absolute risks, but there are also some, sorry, the absolute rights. There are also some rights which fall um, under Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, and they're around how birthing individuals give birth and their right to choose where they give birth, how they give birth and who's present when they give birth. Um, and Article 8 also gives partners the right to be present at the birth of their baby as well. Now, this set of rights can be restricted in certain circumstances. And one of the beauties of the human rights framework in some ways is that it's actually flexible enough to deal with circumstances like coronavirus. So these rights can be restricted, but three tests need to be met. There needs to be a law that allows the restriction. There needs to be a legitimate aim. So protecting the health of others in the context of coronavirus would be a legitimate aim. And crucially, the restriction needs to be proportionate. So how would this work in practice? So we have a director of midwifery or a senior manager who's looking at how they can run a safe and effective maternity service when they're facing all these pressures, as, as many um, managers and heads of midwifery will have been in this situation over the last few weeks. So the first step to ensuring that any decision is proportionate is looking at what it would take to keep existing services running. And we've seen some trusts do really creative and innovative things to address these issues. So obviously PPE has been an issue, but uh, around staff shortages are other things that trusts can do and, and trusts have shown that they can do to uh, bring back retired staff or to give contracts to independent midwives or to um, move midwives who are currently in a non-clinical role back to a clinical role. 
or to use existing staff differently, for example, using maternity support workers perhaps to support a midwife at a home birth rather than having a second midwife. These are all really legitimate responses to this crisis. Um, and you know, if ambulance response times are an issue, we've seen Trust respond by putting in place a standard operating procedure which allows less urgent transfers to be done by private car or private taxi, um, which is again is a great innovation and great response to this sort of crisis. I just wanted to acknowledge you know, the fear that we've seen among staff um, over, um, over the past few weeks, and that's a very valid fear. But it's also really important that, that women's um, fears and the impact on them is, is represented in these decisions. And NHS England guidance states that MVP, maternity voice partnership chairs, must be involved in decisions so that it's really clear when we're making a decision that all factors have been considered and all viewpoints have been considered. And the other thing that could help is collaborating with other local trusts um, as part of your local maternity system. But it's important that that's about um, raising the game of the entire local maternity system, not reducing it to the lowest common denominator. So if, if the service has looked at this step and concluded that it's not possible, to continue services as they are because of the pandemic. You know, that, that's, that's legitimate as long as they've looked at all the reasonable options for doing alternative things. So the next step would be to look at what other options there are. And in terms of getting to a rights respecting decision, what we're looking at is whether there are the resources available to deliver these options, what impact it has on the rights of service users, and what impact it has on stopping the spread of COVID. But it's important to point out that, that COVID doesn't trump all. Uh, it's, it doesn't, it, it, water birth is a good example. So the, the evidence for um, restricting water birth is, is very weak, but it's a significant restriction on a woman's right not to have access to that for pain relief and birth. Um, and so it's about weighing up um, the, the benefits of water birth and, and the potential risks in terms of the spread of COVID and the right decision, even if it means that there might be some residual risk, um, might be to, to allow water birth to continue in that situation. It's also really important to think about unintended consequences. We've seen a, a huge increase in, in free birth or unassisted birth as a result of withdrawal of home birth services. Um, which perhaps wasn't anticipated as, as one of the responses um, to withdrawing those services. So it's important to think about those unintended consequences as well. So in this generic example, where I've assumed that the impact of all of these options would be the same in terms of um, stopping the spread of COVID, you would go for um, option four as having the smallest impact on individuals' rights while still achieving the legitimate aim. So in summary, a proportionate response um, to coronavirus is about finding the option that places the small, smallest restriction possible on individuals' rights while meeting the legitimate aim of protecting health um, based on the evidence that's available, whilst recognising that you know, the evidence base isn't always strong. It's not necessarily about choosing the option which has the most impact on stopping coronavirus, um, some, it's about weighing up the, the benefits and the risks. And it's really important that, that uh, services are clear about why they're putting um, a restriction in place. Because if you're not clear about why you're putting a restriction in place, it's very difficult to uh, know when that, that should be removed. Um, it's obviously important to involve users and to look at options at collaborating with others locally. So once you've decided that you have a proportionate restriction that's been put in place, um, it's important to keep looking at individual in exceptions to that, um, to that general rule. Um, there's still a duty on trust to make reasonable adjustments for women with physical disabilities, for example, which might mean making an exception to visiting restrictions. And what looks like a proportionate decision is going to vary according to the decision. So birth rights, which um, our view is that there is 
unlikely to be a situation where banning birth partners uh, could be deemed appropriate or proportionate as a decision. Um, but other decisions may, may be deemed um, proportionate. So if we take home birth, for example, that might be a, a proportionate response to withdraw home birth if staff shortages are significant at the peak of the coronavirus. But a few weeks later, if staff shortages are back to a better level, that might no longer be a proportionate response. So in summary, um, there are always absolute human rights that need to be upheld e even during the pandemic. Um, but there are also set a set of rights that are qualified rights, um, which can be restricted, but services need to be clear that the restriction is proportionate. And how do you know if a decision is proportionate? Well, you need to know that you've explored all options to keep existing services running, and that you've then looked at all different alternatives for uh, changing the service, and you've considered what impact it has on individuals' rights, what impact it has on stopping the spread of coronavirus and any other risks or benefits, and you've weighed those up and come to a decision about the best option to proceed with. And then once you've got that decision, you continue to look at individual decisions and you continue to review if circumstances have changed. So um, I'd be really interested to hear from other people what they feel that the lessons are going forward. Um, th these are some of ours. I think we're, we're keen to see transparency over decisions that are made um, in response to coronavirus um, as we go forward. I think there's probably room for more community options and more of an emphasis on community care, given that the evidence that's emerging. I think there's a lesson about communication and that keeping pace with decision making, um, which hasn't always happened to date. And there's also some lessons about looking at unintended consequences and particularly the impact on marginalised groups. But we recognise that you know, the, the evidence is developing, everybody's done their best and really tried to do what's best for women given um, the circumstances. And the important thing is that we evaluate and look at the lessons learned and decide what we could improve upon and, and what things could be different going forward. So um, that's a bit of a, a canter through. Um, I, um, I've got some suggestions for further reading, which, which you're welcome to take up. Um, I, I've shared them with Sue and I know she's gonna put them on, on the website, um, but really looking forward to hearing your questions after. So Leslie, I believe. Great, thank you very much, Maria. Fabulous, thank you. I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm assuming that uh, birthrights are busy asking trusts about what they're doing in terms, in terms of evaluating what's happening. Is we that... are, yes. We, we try and work on a model of empowering uh, women who contact us to ask their own questions of trust. Yeah. Oh, um, but if they don't get a satisfactory response or um, it's a bit of a more general policy issue, then we will write to trust. And we've got we've got a list on our website of the people that we've written to. But yeah, we, we have done a lot of that. I didn't know because you've been quite busy on that. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. I think you've given a, a lot of food for thought. And I think I'm hoping that, that I can hear my phone bleeping through with some questions for later. So uh, those of you who are listening, if you have questions for Maria, or and, and later for Leslie, please do send them in. It doesn't matter how big or small they are, we'll, we'll try and answer as many as we can. So I'm really pleased now to go on to our next speaker, which is Professor Leslie Page, who is well known to many, many midwives. She is um, professor, visiting professor in Midwifery at King's College. She is an adjunct professor at UTS in Australia at Griffith University of Australia and an honorary research fellow at Oxford Brookes University. And people know her for her work internationally as an academic and advocate and activist for midwives, mothers and babies with more than 32 years midwifery experience. And she's done just about everything, clinical practice, management, leadership, academic and policy work. She's practicing, practiced midwifery in the community, hospital and home birth settings and continues to practice in Oxfordshire. She's worked and lectured around the world. She was the first professor of midwifery in the UK at Thames Valley University in Queen Charlotte and was also has also been the president of the Royal College of Midwives. 
She was also known as the member of the expert maternity group, the writing uh, Changing Childbirth, uh, published in 1993 and was specialist advisor to the House of Commons subcommittee responsible for investigating the state of maternity services in 2003 and advisor to the King's Fund inquiry into the safety of maternity services in 2007 to eight. She's received an international alumni award at, uh, in Sydney and an honorary DSC in, from U University of West London in, in November 13, 2013. And she was also made a commander of the British Empire for Services to Midwifery in 2014. So welcome, Leslie. Thank you so much for stepping into the breach. And um, the floor is yours, or the screen is yours, whichever. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much indeed, and thank you for inviting me. I'm absolutely delighted to be here in this hour, very precious hour. And um, it's really wonderful to follow Maria Booker from Birth Rights, because actually the development of human rights in maternity has been one of the most important developments in recent decades. And Birth Rights, I think, has been hugely helpful to us in developing humanized birth. And Maria, you've given a really good framework for human rights, both the essential human rights and human rights that might be able to be modified, but some tests and rules for thinking about whether that modification should happen. Um, my work over many years can be called the work of humanizing birth. And humanizing birth is at its heart about recognizing the significance of birth, the significance of birth for the baby being born, for the woman being born as mother, for the partner becoming parent and for the family formation. And human rights is an absolutely essential part of it. And it's human rights associated with quality of care. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been faced with one of the greatest incidents in human life in our memory, um, probably since the World War and possibly with greater consequences than that. It's been both frightening, happened very rapidly. We didn't know very much about it. And it has of course taken life and altered our right to go out freely and many of the things that we expect about our life. And what I particularly liked about your presentation, Maria, was about thinking forward what we have learned. And one of the elements of um, the COVID-19 pandemic that I think we need to think about very, very carefully has been the necessity for social distancing. And that social distancing can in itself be dehumanizing because actually as human beings, we rely on being close to each other, communicating with each other. And there's a huge physiological basis to love and the development of human relationship. So one of the things we need to think about as midwives and people running the maternity services, working within the maternity services is really, is our response that we make to the risk of infection appropriate? And what would the impact be? And Maria talked about unintended consequences. What we're having to do really is to balance human rights, public health and quality care. Um, and what happened in the beginning, I think, was that practices were restricted. And now we're seeing an opening up and understanding, particularly where there are strong leaders of maternity services. We're seeing that home births are being restored, that women are having companions, um, that midwifery led services are being maintained and that women can have water births. And basically women should be involved in making decisions about their care together with the midwife. And probably one of the most important things that a midwife can do at this time is to listen to women. But I'm also concerned about the human rights of midwives because for midwives, it's been frightening. They've been under a lot of pressure. 
there is some worry about midwives and nurses and others working through the COVID-19 pandemic, that there might be traumatic experiences and that there might be post-traumatic stress disorder or psychological problems following this experience. So what we have to balance is both the safety, of course, the safety of the woman and the baby and the family, but also the safety of the midwives and staff, maternity support workers and so on working with women. And actually what we need for that is the evidence. And um, we have a huge amount of evidence. And I've been working with a group of professors of midwifery. We're called the Prof Professorial Advisory Group. We've been advising the Royal College of Midwives. We've been doing very rapid reviews of the evidence on issues such as well being of midwives, protection of midwives, um, contact between mother and baby and breastfeeding. Um, induction of labor and interventions, and a whole host of these rapid reviews. And what's really important, I think, is that we remember that the relationship between the mother and the baby, and the baby and the family, and the relationships within the family, are absolutely essential at a time of huge anxiety, um, which can be really difficult for women, particularly if they're from black and minority ethnic um, background or have mental health problems or have disabilities. And thinking about that relationship is absolutely critical. And we will, following this pandemic, it's likely that we're going to feel it for, I would say, at least another year or two years. And we're likely to have a recession following this. And we're likely to see um, increased poverty and deprivation and further marginalization. So this relationship is absolutely critical. And I would say that probably in addition to midwives listening to women, compassion, kindness, and respect are more important than ever. So if midwives are put in the situation that they can listen to women, get to know them, and work with respect, and with compassion and kindness. And similarly, managers and those leading the maternity services need to listen to midwives and maternity support workers, everybody working in the maternity services with compassion and respect. And this compassion and respect and working through relationship, I think will be the thread which will lead to us emerging in a more humane way from this pandemic and watching the press, watching people's responses to it. I'm concerned that we might actually hang on to changes that we've made that aren't helpful and not restore things that are really important. So for example, I would highlight continuity of carer as being something that we need to keep and is really helpful during the COVID-19 pandemic. Community-based services, midwifery-led care, woman-centered individualized care, public health information and support, optimizing normal processes, avoiding unnecessary interventions, and um, promoting skin-to-skin -skin and attachment, enabling women to breastfeed, and supporting women's mental health needs. And we need to have a broader view of the evidence and the concept of safety. And I was really pleased to hear Maria focus on not only physical safety, but psychological safety. And these ideas are all contained in a recent um, publication in Midwifery, which was led by Mary Renfrew and a number of us were involved in it, called Sustaining Quality Midwifery Care in a pandemic and beyond. And it's really thinking about how we manage care during a pandemic, how we get out of the pandemic and looking to the future. And we have seen a number of good effects. Uh, for example, where women have limited visitors, they might be more likely to breastfeed. 
um, we've seen in some areas an increase in the home birth rate. So actually we've seen some good effects and wherever we've seen that, it seems to me that there's a leadership that actually knows what the evidence is, knows the principles, understands human rights, but is able to be innovative, entrepreneurial, um, and keep some of these services going and indeed to increase them. So just my final words on this. Uh, we are in danger through social distancing of becoming more distant from each other, of dehumanizing. But we're actually seeing this wonderful culture developing. I mean, we're all now at the moment in Zoom meetings and we're getting quite used to that. And um, we have different ideas about things. So I think this communication between all of us is really important. And Sue, you sent me a list of resources that you've made available. And it's absolutely amazing how many resources have been created um, in, in the light of COVID. Sorry, that's my, that's my phone telling me that I've spoken for long enough. <laughs> and um, we've actually been scientists, professionals, professional organizations, charities like Birthrights have been tremendously resourceful. And the amount of work that we've developed actually is quite exciting. So I'm not losing track of the fact that this pandemic is absolutely tragic and responding to it has been very difficult indeed. But I think it's important now that we think as hopefully we emerge from it about what we want our future to be. And personally, I want our future to be more compassionate, more empathetic, and in the maternity services, for us to be clear that we're human rights based, that we use evidence and we develop quality care. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Leslie. That just brings us all beautifully together. And it sort of highlights Actually, it is interesting how, mu how much has been achieved and how many things have been done. And I think in, in the sort of what you've been sharing, you and Maria have both been sharing, it, it's kind of thinking about what we as individuals will keep that from this, what we'll learn from, and also what our, the trusts will learn, what higher education will learn, other organisations that support women and, and, and babies and families, what we keep from this because there's been a lot of very good developments and innovations and we're not we're never going to get back to that old normal it's going to be i know that it's a bit of a, a hackneyed phrase now but this new normal is might be better in some ways so it's a, a, a difficult path to take so thank you very much both to leslie and to maria for setting the scene and, and giving us such a lot of information and food for thought if you've just joined us, you're watching Maternity and Midwifery Hour with me and um, Maria and Leslie, and we've been talking human rights. And we now have some time for some questions. And I have to go to my little phone because I've got from the um, Facebook Live, the questions have been fielded through to my phone. So we've got them here. So first on the list, we're ready. And um, Jane Marshall has said, we also need to consider the opportunities available to student midwives as a result of COVID-19 being restrictive and possibly limiting their learning opportunities. Would you comment on that? Maybe, uh, Leslie, as, a, as an educationist, do you think? Yes, I, yes I, I think it's a good question from Jane. And I think I know where she's coming from because there are, I think, a number of places where, for example, Maria talked about water birth being restricted, home birth being restricted, um, midwifery-led care being restricted. And it is really tragic, actually, if students don't get that experience and their, their time in their education is so limited. And I would say that it would be absolutely essential for all staff in the maternity services to think about the experience of student midwives. Of course, in the beginning, 
everybody was drawn into the centre and there was kind of centralised decision making. And this is an understandable response. We didn't know what we were facing. There was concern about the health services being over capacity and so on. But I think it is time now that we have more time to think about it, to think about the experiences of student midwives and to make sure that actually these quality elements of care, the right of women to give birth at home, if that's what they choose to do for midwifery led care, for water birth, um, for reducing interventions that, are, that aren't required, but making sure that interventions that are required are there is really important, not only for the students, but for quality of care. So actually the things that we're talking about that were restricted are absolutely critical to, to quality of care and they don't increase the risk of cross infection um, and they possibly actually safeguard against the risk of, of cross infection. So I would say that the spotlight has to be shone onto students and I would say that for every midwife working with a student, talk to the student and think about how you might actually enhance the experience. And it might be about better discussion, thinking about things differently and so on. But I would say that we need to remember that the student midwives are going through a program that they will never repeat and we must, it is their right to have a high quality education and we have a responsibility to make sure that we provide that. Fabulous, that's fabulous. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on now from that one. Uh, Laura Henry says, question for Maria, really insightful, thank you. And she says, in Ireland, we've had at least one hospital ban partners entirely with little communication or transparency. How can midwives, not necessarily in that hospital, approach questioning and critiquing this move to ensure transparency in the future? Well, that's a tricky one. <laughs> Well, it, it's really good that, you know, Laurie, that you're interested in, in challenging those sorts of decisions. And, you know, I think it's great to have midwives who are, are prepared to kind of ask those questions. And I, I think it's um, about kind of probing if you feel able to or, or getting um, together with a group of, of other midwives who might also feel the same and just um, asking for an explanation of the decisions and, you know, the drivers behind that decision. Um, I think it all, can also be really um, helpful to um, channel kind of women's, the impact on women, um, because it, that's difficult to argue with, isn't it? So if you say, well, you know, we've heard from women that this was the impact on them. This is how they felt about not, not having a partner with them. Um, you, you know, so ca can you explain to me why we have to keep that policy uh, going? Um, so it, it is really tricky, but I think it, we, we really need um, people who are prepared to, to sort of stand up and say, actually, um, we need to kind of give a, a good rationale, a good explanation for, for this policy. So can you, can you explain it to me? And, and perhaps we can look at some alternatives and, and look at what the barriers are to having partners and see if they can be addressed in other ways. So I really encourage you and anybody else to, to do that. Great. I think the getting together with other groups and, or midwives is quite a useful idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Leslie, did you want to add anything to that one? Well, I have other questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think it calls for a radical response, to be quite honest. Um, I think women need to be encouraged to talk about what it means to them. But I think the midwives need to gather the evidence. And actually the RCM um, clinical guidelines, you've put the link into the resources, Sue, have the rapid reviews that um, the professors of midwife did. And there is one on companionship in labor, mm -hmm. and that would give you the evidence immediately. So I think providing your managers, leaders with that evidence, it would be very unethical to continue to deny women the right to have a companion mm -hmm. yeah. in the light of that evidence. So I would say use that evidence and get women to talk as well. Fabulous. So it's another push towards the resources and the, the references. Great. Thank you. Now I've got Clara Lou, who says, this has been amazing so far. Thank you. I'm a head of midwifery in the West Midlands. Hooray for heads of midwifery. <laughs> and have 
have to agree that some of the changes we've been forced to make with of the changes, we're seeing an increase in breastfeeding, breastfeeding rates, increase in satisfaction from women, and a decrease in complaints. The postnatal ward feels calmer without visitors. I feel that we're able to return to restoration services in line with the data feedback and women's voices. We may see a return to visiting for partner only on postnatal ward. So it's just a comment. But then she is asking now, still Clara Lou, Mayor, Mayor, Maria or Leslie, Maria and Leslie, any advice for how I, as a head of midwifery, can encourage obstetric and neonatal colleagues to continue to see the importance of choice during the pandemic? I worry that in some organisations, the pandemic is being seen as an opportunity to really try and restrict care choices to the convenience of themselves. That may not be wholesale, but that's... Leslie, would you respond on yes, that? Yes, I mean, I'm sure Maria will want to respond to this, but I think, first of all, thinking about, first of all, I recognise the difficult position that heads of midwifery are in. We were talking before we came on air, and, you know, I think that they're extremely challenging, challenging jobs anyway, without a pandemic. Um, so I want to respect um, that, that the difficulty of that role and the challenge, but also the opportunity. And my first response would be to get the Maternity Voices Partnership involved. Um, and also to keep going back to the evidence. And again, the RCM website, the resources that you've produced, Sue, give a lot of the evidence. And I think Maria's human rights framework is absolutely critical. So I think using Maternity Voices Partnership, um, talking with people using the evidence is, is really critical. Fabulous. Maria, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it can sometimes be helpful to sort of point out that the starting point is that it's this is a legal right for women to choose the circumstance of their birth. So that the onus is on the trust to show why it needs to restrict the right, not, not the other way around. It's not um, up to uh, obstetricians or neonatologists to decide which choices are available, that it is the woman's right to choose unless there is a good reason for them for not to have that choice available. Um, so I, I think that can be helpful and you know we've, we're always very happy to come in and give training to trusts uh, as well. But I think um, you know I think you know using the evidence and MVPs are also really powerful ways to get that message across but um, yeah I recognize it can be tricky when not everybody is on the same page. It's interesting because with this week we've we've had um, not just this week but over the weeks we've done these hours what's come over from a lot of midwives is the that the team working has been better and communication between professionals has been better so this may be an issue you know, it might be one or two people or it may be just a, a kind of hypothetical because maybe things are getting better mm -hmm. but i've got so, another <laughs> sorry just to, just to add as well that it's, it's important to talk about it in terms of safety i think sometimes um it can be seen as a nice to have and it you know it'd be nice if women have the choice of a home birth or but but the, what we hear from women is that um it, it's really about their safety. You know, many of these women feel desperate enough that they would free birth as opposed to going to hospital because for whatever reason in their past or, you know, how, however they've come to that decision, going to hospital doesn't feel safe to them. So, um, you know, that can also be important to consider when the language we use. And interesting you should say that because we did have a query from Jackie Coovers does anyone have any data on numbers of women choosing free birth during the pandemic? I suspect this might be anecdotal. I don't know, Maria. Have you got data on that as yet? Or is it... I don't have exact data, but I did speak to one of our trustees earlier today, and she said in their area they've seen an eight-fold increase in wow. um, birth without midwife. Wow. Gosh. And Sue, I think the Royal College of Midwives has been doing some work on free birthing, haven't they? Yeah, I think there's some, there's certainly some uh, uh, clinical guidelines on free birthing. And it's certainly uh, an area, you know, as a midwife, I would feel very uncomfortable that a woman would choose to free birth rather than have the support of a midwife. I mean, that's, 
something to think on. Okay, I think this might have to be our last question, and this is from um, Susan Vining, who says, I was wondering if Birthright have found that some trusts have been defensive in their decisions when restricting services during COVID and reluctant to see the women as individuals. Have any women been labelled as awkward for asking that their rights are met? Um, yeah, and as, as I said, we've seen a range of responses. And I think where trusts, um, as, as Leslie mentioned earlier, where trusts have been well led and um, with leaders who uh, understand the evidence and have really thought through their decisions, um, that they, those trusts are, aren't defensive. And there are a lot of trusts who, who aren't defensive. But, but where, um, where trusts or boards have perhaps taken the decision to centralise because it feels like the uh, kind of is easiest option but not necessarily with a kind of strong rationale behind it um i i think those trusts and boards have come a bit unstuck when they've been asked to explain their their rationale and then you do see some defensiveness not enough evidence yeah 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 <laughs> that's that's leslie's line i think actually one more question just one more sneaky one i'm popping in here from Lola Atiko on NATO. Hello there, I'm a midwife currently working on a birth centre as a two trust. The evidence with water birth is reviewed constantly at the moment. Constantly. At the moment, one of my trust is doing them. I was wondering what are the rights of a midwife who feels unsafe facilitating them? From a personal point of view, I have no problem supporting women in water birth, but I'm curious. Good question, Lola. Leslie, what would you say to that? Um, Lola, I, as far as we can see, there is no evidence that um, staff midwives are at greater risk from water birth. Uh, so I think that it's really important to look at the evidence on that. And I think if I were a manager in that kind of situation, um, I might try to find a midwife who was actually comfortable doing water birth and, and really experienced in it. And again, the Royal College of Midwives has published guidelines for water birth in the time of COVID. And so I would really, Lola, really encourage you to read that and to pass it out um, amongst your staff. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I could, I could, I'm sure we could talk for hours. I know we could because we've already had one discussion and this this hour has been absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much to both of you for your input and your wonderful presentations, which have brought human rights very much to the fore in a very human and kind and compassionate way. It's been fantastic. And just to the audience, some of us will be on social media to try and answer some further questions, should you have any. Thank you very much for coming to the to the um, the hour. And uh, there's resources that will be available, which we've all been referring to. Particularly, Leslie's been highlighting some of the RCM um, productions, and Maria's highlighted the um, birthright ones, as well as the new sustaining quality in midwifery care, which is hot off the press. These are all available online, very easy to get hold of and read, and well worth reading. Um, next week, Maternity and Midwifery Hours has got a focus on baby loss and supporting parents and families. And we have Claire Worgan from SANS and Mark Harder from the National Bereavement Care Pathway. And we've got future weeks where we'll be looking at changing times, ensuring women's choices and student midwives' voices. Um, look out for the online festival programme for 23rd of June. That's a whole day of activity. Um, and in the meantime, Thank you very much for attending and coming. I hope you found it useful and as enjoyable as we found it. Um, and stay safe and well. Look after yourselves and your loved ones. And take care. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.